Welcome to Transparency with Diana B, a podcast from wealthmanagement.com focused on advisors' personal well being and healing. In this podcast, we explore some of the deepest struggles and hardships that many advisors face and bring these issues out into the open so that others may find healing. Join us for this journey where we explore ways to overcome the stresses and anxieties as Diana draws from years of expertise and guest experts to manage the personal challenges of advisors. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Transparency with Diana B, a podcast by WealthManagement.com. My name is Diana Britton, and I'm the managing editor of WealthManagement.com. For those of you who are new to the podcast, each episode focuses on a personal development issue facing financial advisors and financial services professionals. Guests join me to talk about their journey dealing with the struggle and how they found healing. My guest today is Chloe Walforth, Managing Director at Angelus Wealth Management in the New York office. Chloe, thank you so much. It's great to have you on the podcast today. Thank you, Diana. It's great to be here. So everyone in this country, especially New Yorkers, especially us New Yorkers, remember September 11th, 2001, um, the day Al-Qaeda coordinated four terrorist attacks on this country, including an attack on the Twin Towers in downtown Manhattan. Nearly 3,000 people lost their lives in the strikes against the Twin Towers, the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and the crash of United Airlines Flight 93 outside Shanksville, Pennsylvania including about 2,600 that were in the Twin Towers. So it's a day that will live on in American history, of course. Um, You know, it certainly shaped our nation's stance on homeland security. But for Chloe, that day means something much more personal and has shaped her life ever since. It's the day she lost her father, who was working at an um, investment bank, Sandler O'Neill, at the time. On, he was on the 100th floor, uh, 104th floor of Tower 2. Right, Chloe? Am I getting that right? That's right. Um, so she's here to talk today about how the events unfolded and um, how that has shaped her life. It's just an incredible story. Um, so, Chloe, can you take us back to 9-11? You know what what happened on that day for you? I know you were you were in high school. Uh, you were sixteen years old, right? Yes, I was a junior in high school. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you are spot on. Um, my dad's name is Martin Phillips Wolforth. Uh, he was actually better known as Buff. Uh, hmm. That was his nickname. Um, it stuck from childhood and um, was what he was called in the office as well. He worked That's in the World Trade. Nickname. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. There are a few few myths as to why that actually came about, but I I'm it's it's still unclear to me, but Buff is really how he was known. And yes, he worked at, as a bond trader at Sandler O'Neill. Um and that day is is actually very clear to me. It was a Tuesday, um a beautiful bluebird day, actually very much as it is right now. It's like funny that every time I speak about 9/11 and in a more public way, I think the weather is always sort of eerily the same. It's a beautiful day mm. today. Um, yeah. But I was uh, a junior in high school. I was actually sitting in French class when a friend of mine walked into the room and mentioned that the World Trade Center had been attacked and hit by a plane. And my teacher calmly asked, you know, if any of our parents worked in the World Trade Center. And I raised my hand, but I remember feeling super calm um, that everything, I'm sure, was was going to be okay. And... Shortly thereafter, I realized it wasn't. Um, I was picked up by my mom, my grandmother. We arrived at home. People started to flock over. Family, friends, tons of food. Lots of food was dropped off. Lots of phone calls. I I actually remember, I mean, there were cell phones, but it was pretty much a landline type of world back then, or at least for me as as a high schooler. And um, I just remember people... Uh, the phone ringing off the hook, and I was, frankly, really frustrated, wishing that people would leave the line open because I felt like my dad would be trying to call home. And so I think think in a a strange way, 9-11, actually the the day of, I still had quite a bit of hope, and that's what I I remember. Hope that he was coming back. 
yeah, hope that he would be sort of walking in the door like he always mm-hmm. had. Yeah. Um, and sort of how, what happened over the, the next 10 days? I know that you, you know, you kind of finally found out that he was, you know, he perished, but, um, what kind of happened in the following days? Yeah. So like I said, September 11th was a Tuesday. Um, and I actually, I might have gone to school the next day. I, I, I was very adamant about returning to school. I sort of wanted my life to, to keep going, um, I also found comfort in being surrounded by other people. Um, but it was that Friday, the 14th, actually a friend of my family's was a journalist. Um, and they had offered me a chance to go on the air on, on Fox News at the time and talk about my dad um, and describe him in detail in case someone saw him or found him in a hospital. And so I remember driving into the city that Friday and actually felt like the world had ended. We never, we did not see a single car from the commute from Connecticut to New York City. And I arrived um, and went on air and, you know, described my dad in extreme detail. I talked about his small hands, his small ears. I mean, I, I was verbally describing him. I guess looking back, it's a bit silly, but um, it was something that was important to me to even at at the very beginning, just a few days later to sort of share his story. And that weekend actually was, uh, was a difficult one. We, uh, my mom and I went into New York city to the park Avenue armory. Um, and we went to go drop off his dental records because that was a way for them to be able to identify him. Mm. I remember a few things. One, we went to go hang missing flyer, um, missing flyer or flyers of missing people. And I remember just sort of running my hand across the armory wall, which was concrete, and it was just completely smooth to the touch. I mean, it was thousands and thousands of photos of missing loved ones. And someone came up to me uh, out of the blue, a woman working for the American Red Cross, and she approached me and actually used my name. And she said, Chloe, I, I saw you on the news on Friday, and I heard how um, I heard you speaking about your father. And I have been thinking about him and just hoping that he returns home. And I think it was at that moment where, you know, how I mentioned this feeling of hope. I, I was no longer hopeful that he was coming home, just given the sheer the devastation that was very clear, you know, being in Manhattan. When this woman came up to me, I think this feeling of hope sort of shifted and I, it was the very beginning of me feeling this enormous amount of support. And quite frankly, this was a complete stranger um, who had done exactly what I had asked of her, which was to think of my dad and just, and really hope for the best. And yeah, so we were one of the lucky families, lucky in an unlucky situation. My dad was confirmed dead, um, I'd say... Uh, I think it was that Monday, so almost a week later, which is very quick. Uh, A lot of people waited weeks, months, and actually never were even able to confirm um, dead. So we were one of the very lucky ones. And so we were able to have a funeral September 22nd. The rest is is history. We were able to celebrate his life and, uh, and again, uh, just continue to move forward um, the best way possible. Yeah. So I know that, you know, sort of in the weeks following his death, it was just a really emotional time for your mother. Um, but also you guys were, she was struggling with the finances, right? Cause that was something that, um, your father, you know, sort of took, took hold of, and he was really responsible there. Tell mm-hmm. us about what happened, you know, with the finances at that point. Yeah, so my my parents were a terrific team, but I I will say that they divvied up the roles. And um, mm-hmm. my dad my dad's role was to handle everything related to finances. Uh, so in the midst of this extreme um, that my mom was facing, she also had this incredible pit sort of an of uncertainty. Um, you know, how would she be able to support us financially, and and could she support us? She actually yeah. had no no idea, you know, of our financial standing um, or really any details about our financial picture. While there was so much that she faced and that I faced, 
um, and our family faced with the loss of my dad, she was really grappling with this underlying um, insecurity about how financially secure we were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how did she kind of get to a place of financial security? It was October and... Uh, I I do I also remember this very clearly. A, a family friend, a best childhood friend, actually came over to our house and asked my mom how she was doing. And you know we had been getting these questions quite often. And they specifically asked, you know, how are you doing financially? And her answer was, I just don't know. Um, and so everything was sort of set into motion. And they said they wanted to introduce her to a financial advisor who would be able to give her guidance and sort of shed light on her financial reality. And at the time, you know, we were really just looking for help. And so little do we know that that relationship would be one of the strongest relationships in my mom's life and, and even in my own and something that uh, is inspiring me, inspires me to this day. Yeah. Um, but my mom talks about sort of the first time she met her advisor and he asked her, what her greatest fear was. And of course, you know, outside of things that you can't control, but what is your greatest fear of sort of the things that you can control or you feel mm -hmm. like you can control? And she said her greatest fear was having to abandon the life that she and my dad built together. But most importantly, you know, would she be able to take care of and financially support me, her daughter? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to ask, you know, sort of how did he, you know, help you guys sort of get over some of those hurdles? So my mom's financial advisor operated a bit differently than probably your average day financial advisor would. Mm -hmm. The attacks on September 11th opened up a, a sort of a different type of approach where since my mom really had no understanding of what her life, her financial life looked like, he asked her to put together in a and as many shopping bags as she could, basically every piece of paper she thought was related to her financial well-being. And yeah. so she went over to a perfect stranger's home with tens of bags filled with paper, and he asked her not to organize it. Um, and he said to drop it off and that he needed a few weeks and that he would go through everything and be able to answer her question, you know, be able to tell her whether or not she should be fearful of not being able to provide for her daughter or, you know, being fearful of having to sort of abandon her previous life. And mm -hmm. that is when the real relationship started. And my mom went back to his home a few weeks later and he basically looked her in the eye and said, you have nothing to worry about. You're going to be fine. And it was just in that moment that everything then sprung from there. Not only did he help advise her in terms of um, investing a portfolio, he also helped her find different products in the market that would allow for some sort of um, sleep at night security uh, that, mm -hmm. you know, was very knowing my mom and, and knowing what's out there in the market. It, it made a lot of sense for her. Um, and really he was her advocate and her partner and and helped enormously with um helping her through the 911 victims compensation um and really stood by her sort of uh every step of the way specifically in those weeks months and and really two years i'd say he spent um daily with my mom sorting sorting this out for her and for me yeah, uh, and now like their relation—it was very hands-on. And now our their relationship, which I, I can I still witness. You know, it stems from that that unbelievable connection they had in the beginning. But you know, he he does still remain um, a a big source of comfort and support for her to this day. Yeah, it sounds like exactly the type of support she needed at that time. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about tell us a little bit about your experience going off to college, um, and how did your uh, father's death kind of shape your future? I think I, I honestly my my life would probably look very different if my dad hadn't died, and in particular mm -hmm. hadn't died in the attacks on September 11th. 
Um, and I, I say that in, in a positive way, not in a negative, uh, feel bad for me way. I, I mean that when, while there was so much sort of grief and despair and extreme loss that came from the events, there was also an incredible amount of support, which I've mentioned before, but um, some really positive, amazing things that happened. And mm. uh, one of them is the response that Sandler O'Neill had to the attacks. Mm. Um, they were, you know, a small investment banking firm, but man, did they have a lot of power and, and a lot of grit. Um, mm -hmm. They they lost um, an, an, a big portion of their firm, um, about 66. There's 66 people. of their 171 partners. That's right. So yeah. they took a big hit on September 11th, and they decided that they would move forward and not only on a from a business standpoint, but also in a really incredible way um, to memorialize the people that they had lost. And the way they did yeah. that was they set up the Sandler O'Neill Foundation, which was committed to sending all children who had lost parents on 9-11 at Sandler O'Neill to college. Yeah. And that was an incredible thing for them to decide to do. I think, you know, they made up their minds September 12th. It was very, very immediate. Um, and it was the way yeah. they felt like they could continue those, the, the stories and the lives of the, their colleagues that they had lost by pouring such an incredible um, dedication into their children. And so yeah. I was one of the oldest. I think, I think I was the second person to go to college in this group of children. Um, the youngest one was about six weeks old. So you know, it took a wow. while, but we have now all gone to college. Wow. Um, and so Sandler uh, sent me off to Princeton fall of 2013 and to have their support and this incredible financial commitment made, it made all the difference for me and for my mom. Tying back to finances, that was a huge huge relief. I just wanted to give a little bit of background on Sandler O'Neill because I think they have a really interesting story. Um, so I, I know a lot of publications have sort of written about that they've come back from, from September 11th. Uh, they call it the little big firm. And <laughs> the firm, so the firm was acquired by Papper ja uh, Jaffray in January of 2020, and they merged it in. Um, that deal capped an 18-year effort to rebuild Sandler after 9-11. Herman Sandler, a uh, co-founder of the firm, and Chris Quackenbush, the head of investment banking and senior managing principal, they were among those who perished. Uh, so senior managing principal Jimmy Doon, uh, he's, he survived. Um, and as a memorial to Quackenbush, Dune bought all the duck ties he could find at the Brook Brothers store across the street from Sandler O'Neill's office and handed out the quack ties the day the deal was announced. I thought that was kind of funny, um, but in, in honor of him. And, um, you know, apparently that there were 76 children um, that they sent to college for, uh, you know, of, of murdered employees. So it's it's a it's an incredible story there, but um, so tell us about how you eventually came became a financial advisor yourself, um, and you know how did that advisor that really helped you guys through that hard time, you know, inspire you and um, you know shape your career as an advisor? Yeah. So my uh, my desire to get into finance was uh, definitely stemmed from my dad's role. You know, I think I, it was just something that I had always wanted to emulate, but, but had no idea how, um, mm -hmm. and when, yeah. and, um, I started off in the industry right out of college. Um, part of that was I was introduced to the right people, um, people that gave me incredible advice and also gave me opportunities that I could just sort of take without questioning 
Um, and that's really what led me into the advisory space. Um, I gravitated towards work that had to do with individuals and families and speaking to them about their personal um, their personal finances and also what really sort of matters most to them in life. You know, I think if you read about my dad online or in um, newspapers, a lot of things were said about him. But one of the reoccurring themes was that he was a values guy. He mm. really lived his life according to his value system. And that, I think, is one of the things that really stood out to me about him, but also the line of work of financial advice, because you're speaking to individuals and families and really helping them stay true to their values um, in every sort of financial decision that they make. And I learned so much from my clients because every single person is different. Every single person's needs are different. And their their own needs and desires change, you know, many times. There are many different iterations. But it's always sort of staying true to those core values um, that I think has always been inspiring to me. And that certainly has a lot to do with the type of person that my dad was and the type of uh, role he played in my life. So I'd say getting into the advisory work, it was very clear that I liked speaking to people about their personal situation. Um, and that's where private client wealth management um, roles really spoke to me. Yeah. I mean, I know that you were telling me that, you know, hiring a financial advisor, that decision is such a personal, uh, you know, decision in terms of who you decide to partner with on that. It is. Um, and, and that really goes back to my very first entree into what a financial advisor does and, and how they, the role that they play in your life. I mean, mine was, as, as we've discussed, um, very particular um, mm -hmm. and sort of under a microscope, just given the set of circumstances. But what I saw at a young age was the power of financial advice and the freedom that it gave my mom to be able to sleep at night. Uh, it allowed me to continue to pursue whatever it whatever it was that I wanted to do um, without having sort of the fear that financially I wouldn't be able to accomplish it. Or um, And also for my mom, um, just having that partnership and someone to bounce ideas off of at every step of the way was really irreplaceable. And so I think for me, when I look back on it, the time was filled with tons of people and support and yeah. people people in our lives that express sympathy um, and empathy. But I think the piece for me that is, is so important in a, a client advisor role is the piece of compassion because what I saw with my mom was her financial advisor could understand, um, you know, from a sympathetic standpoint, I, you know, understanding cognitively that she was going through a very stressful and difficult time. Mm -hmm. The emotional side of things, it pe people were desperate to empathize with us. And as you mentioned at the start, you know, everyone was impacted by 9-11. It doesn't matter if you lost someone directly you know of someone who lost someone, you're a New Yorker and you saw what happened to the city, um, yeah. but you, you're you an American or you're just, you live all in, across the globe. Uh, you, whoever you speak to, if you mention that day, people remember exactly where they were and exactly what they were doing. But so Absolutely. for me, for me, this having a role model and, and seeing the role of a financial advisor play not only the sympathy part, not only the empathy part, but the compassionate part where an advisor was motivated to act to, in service of my mom, 
in service of her personal growth, in service of my personal growth. And to help us get there, it was important to make sure we were making sound financial decisions. And that just, the light bulb went on for me. I was like, wow, this is really important. It is really important to have clarity on these things because you can't predict what's going to happen. And I'm not saying that everyone should go out and become a financial advisor. I'm not saying that that's necessary at all. I'm What I'm saying is that, to me, it's finding one that can act as your advocate, even, you know, in times of, of success and then also in times of, of loss. Absolutely. Chloe, I think, you know, we, we all think about just the tragedy that happened on that day and how awful it was. But I mean, to see the hope that, that it brought you to see the, the, the support that people around you brought to that situation and, you know, to see some of the positives that came out of it for you, for you in your life. Um, it's just, I think it's important for uh, other folks to hear that and um, to be reminded of the hope that can come out of these types of tragedies. Uh, not that we should not remember how awful it was either, but um, I just really appreciate you sharing this whole story with us. So thank you. Chloe, I know we're, we're running a little short on time here, but I wanted to, I didn't want to end without asking you, you know, about the firm that you work with now, Angeles Wealth Management, and, you know, how did you sort of come to be um, with, with them? Yeah, I got a call out of the blue from a former colleague who had actually already joined Angeles um, with an offer to be on the ground floor of the launch of the New York office. I was a client advisor at another financial firm and actually wasn't looking for a job. But when I heard the Angelus story, I couldn't say no. And so here I am. Yeah. And so how large is it now and kind of what do you guys focus on? Our team uh, collectively referred to as Angelus Investments, which actually includes both institutional and private client assets, advises on over $40 billion of institutional assets and $2 billion of private family assets. I work wow. with, I currently work with about 30 families, and so the service is very high touch. In terms of what Angela specializes in, our story is, is pretty much twofold. One, we provide private clients with the same investment opportunities uh, as we would for one of our larger billion dollar institutional clients. And so investment access for individual families, I think, is really unparalleled. And two, we build investment portfolios for clients coupled with wealth management services. So these services include advice around tax, uh, estate planning, financial planning, philanthropy, and multi-generational investing. So we really cover the, the full spectrum of holistic wealth management services. That's great. I mean, I know that's really the direction the industry is going in. Um, well, we're just about out of time. I'd like to thank my guest, Chloe Wolferth, for being on the podcast and sharing some, some painful memories um, and experiences with us, but, you know, sort of some of the positives that, that came out of that. Um, so, Chloe, thank you so much for being on. Diana, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be a part of this podcast. It's wonderful that you're connecting um, these very personal stories uh, in, with the financial industry. So thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. If you'd like to reach out to Chloe or you have questions for her, you can reach her at cwolferth at uh, angeluswealth.com. Um, and, you know, this information will also be in the show notes. If you yourself have a struggle and you wish to share your experiences and help others in similar situations, please feel free to reach out to me at transparencywithdianab at gmail.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to Transparency with Diana B., if you've not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This is Diana Britton reminding you that where there's healing, there is hope. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Transparency with Diana B podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available.
The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of wealthmanagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider with any questions you have regarding your particular situation.